We're in the city of London, of course, as it happens, and um, this city was one of the first places where death registration was taken quite seriously and in quite a pioneering way, actually, in the um, 1670s, so quite a long time ago. John Grant published these so-called bills of mortality, only really covering the city of London, but it was at least a, a starting point. About a hundred years later, um, in Sweden, uh, Vargentin got to the point of doing the same thing for the whole country. And that was uh, another you know, significant scale up from just one, one city to uh, uh, mortality statistics for, for, for a whole country. And even from these very early efforts, it was clear that there were massive advantages and gains to be made by simply documenting deaths and tabulating them in constructive ways. It wasn't really anything more complicated than that at this stage. And this was an era, obviously, where not very much was known about the health of populations. There was very little health service data and all the rest of it. So the one thing that was easiest to get a handle on was the pattern of, of, of cause of death. When people ask me why I'm slightly obsessed with cause of death, I always say, well, you know, it's the simplest thing to do. Each person dies precisely once. And, you know, that, that is not going to change, whatever, you, whatever else happens. And so if you're relatively simple-minded like me, then counting deaths is actually an intellectually um, satisfying thing to do compared with more complex things. The sad part, though, when we look at this early history of cause of death stuff is that we're 350 years on from Grant's Bills of Mortality. We still don't have the global equivalent of these data, and uh, T's just show much more elegantly than I'm doing here. But you know, a, a substantial majority of deaths in the world are still not documented properly, and that's a, a continuing major problem. Just a couple of examples specifically of, of how difficult some of this stuff is. This is actually some work that Global Burden of Disease did on cirrhosis deaths. And the colors are not the numbers of cirrhosis deaths. The colors are the availability of actual data on cirrhosis deaths that were fed into the estimates. And Africa comes out pretty much red, and you can see red is no data. So there were, there were, although cirrhosis deaths were modeled for every country, including all those red ones that had no data, there were actually no cirrhosis mortality data available for a huge swathe of countries, the poorest ones in the, in the world in general. Another example of how you can run into trouble with this stuff, this is Dengue case fatality, again from Global Burden of Disease work, but they ran two models for dengue. One was estimating the number of dengue deaths, and the other one was estimating the number of dengue cases. So being slightly devious, I decided to divide one by the other and work out what the case fatality rates were. And the highest case fatality rate in the world was for the United States by far and away the highest of any country in the world. I don't really believe that. You know, it's about how you count and all, all, all the rest of it. But it, it does show some of the potential pitfalls of not really having the data that you would wish to have in the first place and the dangers of maybe over-extrapolating some of this stuff. In terms of how to determine cause of death, there is, of course, not... What any one way of doing it. And this is um, the whole spectrum of cause of death approaches, right from conventional post-mortems up in the top corner down to verbal autopsy in the opposite corner. And I've deliberately kind of overlapped the, the steps in the chain because, you know, they're, they're, they're not totally different, but there is a definite progression and this is an update of a slide that I've used before because I've added in minimally invasive autopsies. And that's the kind of new kid on the block in terms of um, cause of death approaches. 
And Gates Foundation, Bill Gates actually personally is very interested in this. Gates Foundation are doing quite a lot of work. Is it possible to do needle biopsy type approaches um, shortly after deaths to determine with more precision cause of death, even though there's no death certificate and, uh, and, and, and so on? PLOS will publish a collection of papers around this uh, new area of work fairly, fairly soon. So this is a, an up-and-coming thing, which I'm not going to say any more about here, but it's an interesting development in the overall um, scheme of things. So I'm going to concentrate now more on the verbal autopsy um, part of the, of the spectrum, although... As Tees rightly says, when you have some deaths in facilities and some deaths in the community and so on, it may be that you have some deaths that are further up this chain than the verbal autopsy end, and that, that's a potential source of confusion as well. Verbal autopsy as the most pragmatic solution, I would say, for these millions of missing causes of death around the world, because as you will have gathered, the, the missing, the unregistered deaths are not uniformly distributed around the world. This is basically a problem of, of, of poverty in one way or another. So we're talking about Africa, parts of Asia, parts of Latin America, where almost no deaths are registered in many countries. The advantage of verbal autopsy is that the actual verbal autopsy interviews can be carried out by school leaver type people with some appropriate training. This isn't a, you definitely don't need medically qualified people. In fact, it has been argued that that's even, that would even be a disadvantage because medically qualified people are quite good at leaping to conclusions about cause of death rather than actually going through uh, the, the, the whole process of the, of the, of the verbal autopsy. So that's a, that's a strength. WHO have recently updated, as T said, the international standards to the WHO 2016 version, and that's very amenable to use, use with, a, with a tablet, as you see in the picture there. So it's a, it's a very structured interview. The, the skip patterns and so on are absolutely horrendous, but if you've programmed them all into a tablet, you can forget about them. So that, that's, a, that's a significant uh, step forward. Interview findings, so that what you get from the interview can be processed using automatic computer methods. And this is where verbal autopsy parts company from your sort of conventional you know, questionnaire survey kind of activity, because you're not actually interested in the end in all the individual parameters that are in the WHO instrument. You want to synthesize all, all the answers that you've got in a verbal autopsy interview into a cause or maybe uh, more than one cause of, of death. So that's where things are different compared with just a, a conventional epidemiological survey where you ask a lot of questions and you make a lot of tables of all the answers. And we're fairly good at that, as I will illustrate in a minute now. But we still face quite big issues about how to make all this happen on a big scale. That, that's really the remaining challenge, and um, how to make it happen in different places, and as Thies explained very elegantly, um, the different sort of structures within which this might be done or par partially done and, and, and so on. That's the remaining uh, uncertainty in many ways. Obviously, it's important to be satisfied that verbal autopsy procedures are effective in the sense that they produce sensible outcomes. It wouldn't be a good idea to do millions of verbal autopsies if we weren't reasonably sure that you got good stuff coming out of them. And this is actually from an article which will be published in Lancet Global Health at midnight tonight. And so your, your homework tomorrow is to log on to Lancet Global Health and, uh, and look at it. I'm sure Zoe would, uh, would endorse that recommendation. But what we did in this article was to take a large database from the in-depth network, over 100,000 deaths that all had standard verbal autopsies processed, and um, we took also the 2013 Global Burden of Disease estimates for the same countries that were where the 
in-depth sites were, were, were located. And this is just the kind of headline um, result. So each point here is one country, cause category, age group, five-year period. It's quite a short article when you get to read it at midnight, but there is an 80-page appendix which gives you a lot more detail if you want it all cause by cause and country by country and, uh, and, and, and such like. So there are some important conclusions here. Um, it's not, this isn't an absolute validation because global burden of disease estimates are not absolutely validated, so it's a co-validation. What we're saying is both the, the verbal autopsy in-depth sites and the global burden of disease estimates tell you a very similar story, even though they follow totally different patterns and pathways to, to, to get there. So we can't say one is better or worse than the other. We're just saying that they are actually statistically very, very similar on, on a large scale. Um, that slightly refutes Thies's comment about, which is the, the default comment that's always made that um, population surveillance sites are unrepresentative. I mean, the, the, I prefer to say that it's difficult to demonstrate the representativeness of, of, of such sites. I mean, it, it, it's, it's not quite the same thing as assuming that they're unrepresentative. And this actually tends to suggest that they are not so unrepresentative because we're comparing here national estimates with what's come out of sites. But it works much better when you have several sites in a country, definitely. And of course, that, that is um, something about increasing representativity and having networks of, of sites. So that, that's, um, and that's discussed in the, in the article. I won't go into this in any more detail now, but to say that's, um, that's going to be available to read tomorrow. Taking verbal autopsy to scale is an interesting problem. I mean, Thies told us a few minutes ago that 37 million deaths annually are not adequately registered or reported in the sense that they don't get into the WHO system. So I did a little bit of back of the envelope um, calculations here because we're, we're just, we've just been developing an, a new iteration of InterVA, InterVA 5, which isn't released yet, but it will be very soon. So I had something to benchmark, and when it runs on my laptop, it processes about 100 VA records a minute. Okay, That's it. so it's, it's, it's fairly fast. And it uses about four kilobytes of storage to store the details of, of each case that you process. Now, if you extrapolate that, then an ordinary laptop, if it was running 24-7, and it had 256 gigabytes of storage, you could, in principle, over the course of a year, process 50 million verbal autopsies. Okay, in other words, all of the unregistered deaths in the world could be processed on a single laptop if, and this is a huge if, if you'd done the verbal autopsy. <laughs> okay. But I think that's a worthwhile kind of train of thought because we're, we're no longer in a situation where actually attributing the causes from verbal autopsy interviews is really the, the big obstacle. We, we, we know how to do that with a reasonable degree of, of, of quality and speed and, and, and effectiveness and you know, at, at virtually no cost. The, the tricky bit is getting the source material, actually identifying the deaths making sure that the interviews are done. Of course, you can't do 100 verbal, one person can't do 100 verbal autopsy interviews in a minute. I mean, it's more like 15 or 20 minutes for, for each case. So that, that's, that's whole orders of magnitude, different, um, different workload. But it's, um, I think it's quite important not to get hung up about how difficult it is to assign cause of death to verbal autopsy interviews. If you can do the interviews, you can, you can get the cause of death. That's, that, that's, that's, that's really no longer a, an important um, obstacle to consider. Adding value to verbal autopsy, and this to some way, in some ways is um, a little bit of a lead into stuff that uh, Karin Schalander will come on to uh, later this morning. But, and it's also work that Lu, where Lucia uh, D'Ambrosio has done a lot of the formative um, work beh behind this. The traditional approach of verbal autopsy has been to simply do the medical cause of death in the 63 
categories that WHO defines as spanning ICD. And that's, that's the first and foremost objective of doing verbal autopsy. Social autopsy is another thing which I'm not going to speak about at all. But somewhere in the kind of um, space between conventional verbal autopsy and, and social autopsy, we've been playing around to say, what else could we add easily and, you know, basically at not really any overheads in terms of aut automatic coding. What could we add on large numbers of cases without making the interviews more complicated? Um, Lucia did quite a lot in terms of uh, formulating the 10 last questions in the WHO 2012 verbal autopsy instrument, which have been carried through to the 2016 one. And we now have a system which will be part of InterBA 5 once it's released for categorizing as a separate exercise to the cause of death for each case, the circumstances of mor mortality in six categories. You see there, cultural, emergency, health systems, inevitable, knowledge, resources. And what you see here, which I think is a, a, a little bit of a sort of proof of the pudding, as it were. I mean, nobody can say that this is right or wrong. It's not like court medical cause of death because we're, we're proposing this as a new kind of uh, additional uh, value onto, onto verbal autopsy. But if you look at the chart there, you can see that different groups of medical cause of death along the horizontal axis do have very different patterns of circumstances of mortality associated with them. So the external causes, the accidents and injuries and so on, they tend to be associated with emergencies. Okay, that's not surprising. That's kind of what you, what you would expect, but that's what we're seeing coming out of the model. Um, there are many other categories there. So the, the neonatal deaths are more associated with, with health systems issues. The maternals, not surprisingly, are also strongly associated with, with emergencies. The um, NCDs, the biggest category there is resources, lack of resources, in other words, for people to um, access health care and so on. So this is just a, a, a postulated framework which we think adds value. And it's not only we that think it adds value, we've developed this quite uh, strongly in conjunction with the South African Department of Health, and uh, they've uh, provided quite a lot of input in saying you know, what we would like to know about deaths in addition to the medical cause of death is this kind of stuff. And you can imagine it's very, be re very relevant if you're a district or a provincial um, head of health services. It's, it's very important to know what you know, to what extent are various causes of death associated with health systems difficulties or um, other kinds of difficulties, because some of these are amenable to health systems changes and some, some are not. So that's a, a, a sort of little new, uh, basically for free, add-on to the verbal autopsy. So, in conclusion, there's still a major gap in global mortality data. There's no arguing about that. VA is a potential approach to closing that gap. It may not be perfect, but it's, it's a considerable, um, considerably useful technique. The main outstanding obstacle is actually getting those VAs done. That's, that's really the issue in, a, in large scale. And the circumstances of mortality concept, I think, adds value to basic VA cause of death concept and is useful for health planning, um, particularly in settings where it's not feasible to do you know, large-scale social autopsy, which is a, another resource-intensive um, thing to do, although very interesting to do in, uh, in, in, in some circumstances. Thank you very much.